Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre, one subgenre at a time. And this week, we reach the end of our ninth season exploring the evolution of Home Invasion. It's part 36, making it officially the longest ever season of this podcast. And this week's episode is going to be our conclusion episode. So this week, as ever, it's just going to be me taking a little look back at what we've learned over the last several months. Uh, I'm also going to be reading some audience feedback. I'm going to be finding out what you guys thought of this particular season of the podcast. Uh, Mary, Wild is going to drop in for a little wrap up chat and we will finish by running down the listeners top 10 home invasion movies of all time a huge thank you to everybody who sent me their feedback sent me lovely emails sent me their top 10 lists I'm going to get through as much of that later on in this episode I uh, hope you are all well I hope you're all ready for a, a nice festive break Christmas is just around the corner I am very much ready for a little break and speak Speaking of, uh, this is going to be the last episode of the season, which means that we're going to go on a little break, a little hiatus here on the main feed. Uh, The podcast is going to go into hibernation for a couple of months. Uh, There may be the odd bonus episode dropping, however, so do keep an eye on your feeds just in case. But the next time we're back properly will be for our 10th season of the podcast, which is going to kick off uh, in the spring of 2024. And if you hold out until the very end of this episode I will be discussing in depth what the subgenre for the next season is going to be and I'm going to be discussing some of the films that will be covered and I am already so excited for the next season. But don't forget, while we're on a little break, you can continue listening to new episodes of The Evolution of Horror if you sign up to our Patreon. So head to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Uh, if you sign up at $5 per month, you will get at least one new episode every month, uh, including Fresh Blood and a bunch of other uh, back catalogue episodes. But if you sign up at $10, you will get a new episode every single week. During our hiatus, it'll be like we never left uh, we're in the middle of a little Yorgos Lanthimos uh, mini series at the moment for $10 donors so we're covering some awesome films like The Killing of a Sacred Deer and Dogtooth and The Lobster uh, and we will be covering Poor Things, his new movie in the next couple of weeks as well. There's also going to be a special top 20 horror movies of 2023 episode that's going to be coming soon to Patreon and a whole bunch of other great bonus content. So if you need to fill that EOH shaped hole in your life then please sign up to our Patreon channel while we are off air. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, let's kick off this week's episode by having a little look back at what we've learnt over the last 36 episodes as we conclude our journey through the evolution of home invasion. What are your thoughts on on home invasion films generally? Um, I'm probably the same as a lot of your guests that it's not my favourite. It's my it's my worst subgenre, I would say. Of yeah, horror. I'm not that into it, mm-hmm. um, and I do find it very hard to watch. My thoughts generally range from like uh, to oh, I'm so mad. I get so <laughs> mad at home invasion films. I I think I have a lot of issues with them. Like they're the one subgenre that I just sometimes can't face. Yeah, there's no metaphor. It's like somebody's going to break into your house and hurt you. Last year, when I announced I was covering Home Invasion for the ninth series of this podcast, I was met with some resistance and trepidation from listeners and my guests. I mean, it's an interesting one because I remember when you mentioned like that this was what the series was going to be. I was kind of like, my first thought would be, say, Straw Dogs or Funny Games, like very, very bleak movies. As horror fans, we love being scared. But for some reason, Home Invasion seems to push us too far. And for so many of us, it's our least favorite subgenre. But why? Sometimes it just can veer a bit too far into meanness for the sake of meanness, you know? When I think home invasion, I just think people getting tied to chairs and abused and tortured and all of this, and I'm not a fan of that. This is a much more human horror. This doesn't have the safety of supernatural, this doesn't have the safety of monsters, this is the idea that humans will do horrific things to each other as much as non-horror fans think that horror 
fans are gore hounds were actually really very cuddly and very actually very very sensitive so <laughs> over the last 35 episodes i've looked at the history of traditional home invasion but much to the relief of many of my guests i've also looked beyond the typical movies we might think of in this subgenre and branched out into something broader well i'm glad that the movies that you're covering i appreciate that you kind of take an oblique approach to it at times. Yes. What I like about your series that you've done is how you've opened it up and sort of been quite loose with how you're defining it and getting in films like Sunset Boulevard and, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuff like that. And the moment you start to do that, and obviously there's a load of great classics out there. And so perhaps I misled you all with the title of this season. It's not really been a series about home invasion. It's simply been a season about the horrors of the home. Hundreds of years, evil thoughts and evil deeds have been committed within these walls. The house itself is evil now. But let's begin for a moment by looking at the traditional home invasion movie. Who on earth could that be? If we were to break down what defines a home invasion movie, the definition is pretty simple and self-explanatory. A home invasion, quite simply, focuses on one or more protagonists in their home being targeted by some kind of antagonist, either a single intruder or group of intruders. Hello. Hello. Sorry to disturb you. I'm staying next door. I saw you earlier at the gate. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, please, come in. Usually the films are simple, stripped back. They have a sense of immediacy. Unlike a slasher movie which might provide you with backstories, flashbacks, a large group of characters to be killed off one by one, multiple set pieces set across different locations, home invasion films tend to take place across one night, sometimes in real time. They're set in a single location and they usually focus on very few characters. Is Tamara here? No. No, you got the wrong house. Sometimes simplicity can be very difficult, you know? Oh my God. To kind of, you know, when you strip it of kind of everything apart from like the bare essentials, yes. it's very much just exists then and there in the moment. Yeah. And I think so few films do that. Everything they talk about is just what's happening in yes. that moment. And there's not a moment they, you know, wander off and they're thinking about like, oh, do you remember that time and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, or, you're right. you know, it, it exists purely in that space. And that's what I kind of love about it because I think that imagine you're kind of going through that. It's like, all you do is would exist in that moment. Home invasion films trap us in a horrific situation, lock the doors and let us suffer. You are with the characters, so you know as much as they do. You don't have extra information because we're the viewer. Like, we're just like, we don't know what's going on. We don't know who they are. They can't rely on multiple body counts and different set pieces to drive the action. Instead, home invasion films have to rely on sustained tension and dread, or sometimes the long, drawn-out torture of our main characters. And why are the invaders doing what they're doing? Often, it's the motive of the intruders that determines how violent or disturbing the home invasion film is. What's going on? For example, in many films, the invaders are breaking into a home to steal something of value, and the invadee is simply the thing standing in their way. All right, this guy is sitting on at least 300k. Boom! In films like Panic Room or Don't Breathe, the intruders aren't intending to commit any violence. Their motive is driven purely by greed. Take what you want and get out! that easy. However, what if the invader has no motive at all? What if they're simply doing what they're doing in order to terrorize, torture, and torment their victims? This is perfectly encapsulated in one of the most infamous lines from one of the most famous home invasion movies, The Strangers. Why are you doing this to us? Because you were home. No one is actually safe. Like, there's a reason that the line has become so infamous because it isn't reassuring. There's no catharsis in that answer where you didn't piss us off. This isn't revenge. This isn't something where we looked at you and said, you're rich. Like, nothing about their situation merits the treatment that they have received. 
That is fucking scary. Many of the most frightening and distressing home invasion movies end on a similarly bleak note. When asked to explain their motivation, the intruders reveal they basically have none. Eel doesn't necessarily appear motiveless, but we understand at the end, it is completely motiveless. Right. And that's the whole fucking point. Like, why did they do it? Why not? No, because they wouldn't play with us. Yeah. Like, like, no reason. And that's home invasion. Violent, terrifying, nasty, nihilistic, mean, and ultimately pointless. But how did this happen? How did this become a subgenre? Home Invasion, in some kind or other, has featured in films for as long as cinema has existed. But I would argue it didn't really become a subgenre until the 1970s, possibly as a response to the real life home invasion that took place in Los Angeles in 1969. Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. We then suddenly get to the end of the 60s, you know, the, the age of Aquarius is upon us, you know, yeah. the hippies were going to change the world, it was all lovely, and it was all lovely for about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and then Charles Manson comes along. Right. This horrific, brutal, and violent murder of this beautiful young Hollywood star and her friends felt particularly sadistic, shocking shocking and entirely random. It, of course, shook the world, the media, and there was a sudden realization that if rich, affluent white people living in mansions weren't safe in their own homes, then none of us were. Once those murders happened, you know, I think the, the interviews with a lot of the, the major figures from that time are a great indicator of the, the feeling of paranoia. That culture of freedom really hardened overnight into something so much more paranoid and fearful. Following this horrific true crime, 1970s horror cinema got nastier, more human and more violent, and home invasion started cropping up in some of the most infamous films of the decade, from Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange I'm Sorry, but we don't usually let strangers in <laughs> to Wes Craven's Last House on the Left. Craven, he felt that kind of reflected violence that he'd seen in the world, that he kind of felt violence could just happen on a switch, you know, just switch on a dime, turn yeah. on a dime, and people can be messing around and having a laugh, and the next minute, you know, something awful happens. These films were unflinching and relentless in their portrayal of torture, sadism, and sexual violence, all of which felt motiveless and random, and all of which took place in modern domestic spaces. I find it very effective in that it's ruling, it's an assault on the senses, it's really, really fucking disturbing. Yeah, this was the birth of what we now all come to think of as classic quintessential home invasion, and we would see more brutal, unflinching movies like these throughout the 80s and 90s, such as Gerald Cargill's Angst. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a fun watch, <laughs> but it's a, but it's a, it's a great watch. And that if you're dealing with this kind of thing, then you have a sort of responsibility to confront the audience with that. And of course, Michael Haneke's Funny Games, the latter of which has become infamous as a kind of endurance test for cinephiles. Just how much torment and sadism can you take? Yes, it's um, a pretty terrifying thriller come horror film, but it is also a film about film, and it's also about our relationship with film, and it's about our relationship um, with violence. Mirroring the 1970s, the 2000s became another decade of unrelenting, unflinching, violent, nasty horror, and classic home invasion had its second boom. <laughs> Films of the new French extremity like High Tension, Inside, Eel, and Martyrs pretty much all focused on home invasions. It's a very angry movie. Like, yes. you know that scene at the end when the girl comes out and she's screaming? Yes. Like, there's a rawness yes. and a realness and a, a weight to some of these mm -hmm. French movies. 
Meanwhile, over in the US, so-called torture porn was on the rise, and audiences were treated to a wave of cheaply made movies about people being held captive and tortured in grotty basements. The good, the good thing about it is it's still, like, it's very domestic. It's not like mm. Hostel, where it's like, here's a big torture drills. room with all the torture drills yes. and all of the rusty <laughs> yeah. whatever. It's like, no, it's a bit of cling film. It's, a, it's some ble- bleach spray. You know, these are the things yes. that are being employed in the, in the torture. And of course, in 2008, Brian Bettino arguably made the most infamous and subgenre-defining home invasion film of all, The Strangers, in which a young couple are terrorised in their home by three violent masked intruders for no reason other than because they were home. Just this idea that bad things could happen to these very nice people on what was already such a bad night for them, it felt like the (laughs) film was doubling down, but in all the best ways. So when we look back at the films that we think of as the kind of classic, traditional home invasion films, Last House on the Left, Straw Dogs, A Clockwork Orange, Martyrs, High Tension, The Strangers, Funny Games... It's no wonder people weren't too excited at the idea of me spending a whole season on home invasion. The, I, you know, my heart really genuinely sank when I knew that you were <laughs> doing a season of home invasion because I know what that looks like for me. And what that looks like for me is you sitting in the living room watching all of these movies. I'm too terrified. To watch. But across the last 35 episodes, I've broadened the scope of home invasion because no subgenre exists in a vacuum. Let's go back to its early origins. Margaret! They want to know if they can stay here for the night. Shelter. They've been caught in the storm. Of course they can't stay. We've already mentioned that a huge component of home invasion is the idea of setting a film across one single night, almost in real time, focusing on a small group of characters under one roof. In other words, the movies are all about that pot-boiling tension of what happens when a group of human beings are stuck together in one place under extreme circumstances. (laughs) Did you hear what he said? There's a landslide and floods. The lake has burst its banks. We're trapped. We're trapped. This idea goes all the way back to one of Universal's earliest horror movies, James Whale's The Old Dark House. This, this film is extraordinarily funny, extraordinarily sophisticated. It's appealingly theatrical, and yet it never feels stagey, which is pretty remarkable given it unfolds in a couple of rooms for the most part. As you said earlier, it's kind of the reverse of it. Yeah. Normally the bad guys invade the good guy's home. This is the good guys invading the bad guy's <laughs> home. And, he, yeah. and that was that's all part, I think, of the subversiveness of James Whale. You know, that, that, that was part of the joke. Right, right. You know, that these, these family of oddball misfits... Mm-hmm who were sort of, you know, keeping the madman in the attic and all the rest of it, yeah. that they were, they were quite happily getting along all right. There were absolutely no problems until all these nice people turned up and, <laughs> then, and it all goes to hell. And I think that was just part of, you know, James Wales' sense of humour. That was the joke. Yeah. The old dark house is the perfect way to describe a particular strand within the evolution of home invasion. Films and works of literature about a group of people stuck in a big old gothic house across one night and terrible things happen happen. Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. Ten little Indian boys went out to dine. One choked his little self and then there were nine. John Willard's The Cat and the Canary. (laughs) And of course, so many of the works of gothic horror writer Edgar Allan Poe focused on huge gothic houses filled with dark secrets and grisly murders. Again, uh, Fall of the House of Usher, it's about it's almost about a house that's haunted by itself. But I think that's very much part of the Gothic. It's it's suppressed desires, it's longing, it's exploring the darkness of your personality and your moods. And, and he does that better than anybody, I think. And, and, and that mix of the environment creating monsters, and it's, it's fascinating. Films like Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs, with its big, sprawling house filled with torture chambers and victims hiding within the walls, feels like something straight out of Edgar Allan Poe. Panic Room, with its secret chamber hidden behind the mirror of the master bedroom, directly references the works of Poe. 
This whole thing makes me nervous. Why? Ever read any Poe? And we're still seeing movies in the tradition of the old dark house even today. Look at the success of Ready or Not from 2019. These people really don't look like they've redecorated in about 100 years. Old you know? money. But, but it's, and I think that's definitely what's trying to elicit this real notion of old money, of tradition, of like old fashioned values. Yeah. Or Bodies, Bodies, Bodies from last year, which felt like a deliberate Gen Z twist on the Agatha Christie and Then There Were None format. I think of, I think of them as like uh, the movie where somebody has an accusing parlor where you yeah. can just get everybody together <laughs> and then somebody can stand in front of a fireplace and like Benoit Blanc or whoever can just kind of be like, hmm. I can't hear, I can see. You're blaspheming. On the contrary, my dear Rebecca, I was merely telling your wandering guests that you were about to thank your gods for their bounty. That'll do. I know your mocking, lying tongue. But part of the tension and fun of the old dark house is also watching the awkwardness and horror play out when so many strangers are brought together under one roof. Have a potato. Thank you. The hilarious scene around the dinner table is a key component of this. This kind of dinner party horror in which several people converge at some kind of social event with violent consequences has also remained a popular trope in this subgenre. In these films are great at just providing a platform for awkward, sometimes twisted, even like perverse social dynamics to play out. <laughs> the home is a perfect setting for exploring human nature, human interactions, manners, etiquette, social norms, and horror films have always enjoyed twisting and subverting this to make us as uncomfortable as possible. From movies as far back as The Old Dark House, right the way through to films like The Invitation in 2015 and the terrifying Speak No Evil in 2022, both films about social awkwardness, social etiquette, and people's manners ultimately leading to their downfall. We don't see you for two years and then all of a sudden we get invited to this lavish dinner. Don't tell me that this is normal. I feel like there is an inherent, there's an inherent awkwardness in the every single social interaction apply to the household even more so mm -hmm. and um and and i think both these films really explore those tensions in really interesting ways why are you doing this because you let me and then of course we got to talk about that line oh what the why are you doing this because you let me right holy oh. mick fuck <laughs> So listen, like, Faculty of Horror, we talked about The Strangers and we talked at length about why are you doing this? Because you were home. Yeah. Boy, that's scary. That's the scariest line in horror. That line, that line. This line <laughs> puts that to shame. And yeah. it is so perfect. Back in the 1930s and 40s, films predominantly set in domestic spaces were often labelled as quote-unquote women's pictures. They would often focus on women's particular positions within the family home, and often part of the plot would involve their safety, their independence, and their position within the home being threatened. The horror of home invasion, when it does centre around this sort of feminised domesticity, is that that undermines the men. Too, yeah. Because the threat, you know, the women are there to keep the home nice. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the if that space, if that feminized space is in danger, then men themselves are the victim of that because they're oasis. You know, they're, they're yeah. placed to, to rest, you know, with the, yeah. the gentle wife. Is, is corrupted or, or, you know, is at risk. So, And of course, you know, the, the, there is that sort of strand of horror that, you know, the monster is sharing your bed with you. Yes, yes. The monster is in the home mm -hmm. the whole time. They're not mm -hmm. trying to get it. They're already here. You've let them in without realising it. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's sort of related to the, the, the home invasion thing in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's all about, you know, your place of safety being violated. In these films, rather than an outside invader, the real threat would often come from inside the house. In Gaslight, a woman's home becomes her prison when her husband begins psychologically abusing her. He said I wasn't any liquor. He said I was going out of my mind. You're not going out of your mind. You're slowly and systematically being driven out of your mind. But why? Why? It's much more um, believable that it does happen to so many women. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, it's incredibly uh, modern in its in its subject um, that's what's really scary as well it's how easily 
that can be done. And in Hitchcock's Dire M for Murder, Grace Kelly spends the night alone in her apartment, unaware she's the victim of a vicious plot in which her husband has arranged to have her killed. Hello. It's really, it just feels like such a transitional film. Yeah. So, you know, with yeah. rope, rope on one side and rear window on the other. Yeah. Um, you can really get the feeling that Hitchcock's nutting out the idea of space. You know, mm-hmm. he's really trying to get a handle on what can be done in a small space. Hitchcock was always fascinated by domestic spaces, our relationships to them, and what happens when somebody violates that space. We see this over and over again in films like Rope, Dial M, and of course, Rear Window. He is very much about the observation of the camera, you know, camera as viewer and and all these kinds of things. And I do think, I think that's because that's what fascinated him. And he was interested in the anxiety of what a family is and what a home is and what a domestic space is, the kind of confinement, confined space, which, as you say, is central to horror. From gaslight to the spiral staircase to dial M for murder, this movement of women's pictures in which a female protagonist is under threat in her own home continued to be incredibly popular in the decades that followed. She is blind and she is alone. The terrible suspicion growing. Gloria, I know you're there. And in these films, it was often the women's place in the home as the wife or the mother or carer of children that was crucial to how and why they were under threat. Hello? Have you checked the children? What? A ch- one chilling sentence that could mean all sorts of things. Does it mean the kids are dead? Is it a trick to make me go upstairs? Mm. You know, I, I, I just think it's literally perfection. There's, there's not a single time I've watched it and not felt utter despair and fear. From Wait Until Dark in the 60s to the terrifying When a Stranger Calls in the 70s to Julia Roberts in Sleeping with the Enemy in the 90s. The opening of this film is so iconic the, with the, uh, yeah. the house on the beach and it's all windows. I think it has to go to do with like the hubris and power that comes from that social class. Like Martin Beach. Laura. Yes. In front of a window. All the way through to the 2010s with Mike Flanagan's hush about a deaf woman being targeted by an intruder alone in her home, which felt like a throwback to the classic proto-home invasion films like The Spiral Staircase and Wait Until Dark. This very creatively, almost politely made horror um, that feels like it belongs to right now but could also perfectly fit in the 90s in the early 90s or like the 1940s almost like there's a classical um, element to it it's not flashy so considering home invasion has this reputation as being brutal and violent and unflinching and controversial many of these movies were made for mainstream predominantly female audiences and all of these films we've mentioned work as great vehicles for leading actresses to give memorable performances, whether it's Audrey Hepburn, Julia Roberts, or Olivia de Havilland in Lady in a Cage. Help! Please! Help! I am trapped in small private elevator! Like, I love Olivia de Havilland so much, and so when I finally was like, oh, actually I've never seen this, and it did not disappoint. This movie is incredible. It is one of my favorites. It is one of those movies you just have to see it to believe it, I think. But the women who star in these domestic set horror movies aren't just the protagonists. Very often, they get to be the villains the monsters. They get to subvert their role within the home in the most fun and grotesque way imaginable. Stinking 
Robert Aldrich's Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is iconic for its two incredible performances from Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, a film that launched a new sub-sub-genre known as Hagsploitation or Grand Dame Guignol, but also the film works as another throwback to the old dark house, the story of a weird family living in a big old house, a house filled with violence, secrets, darkness and madness. Could you imagine being those neighbors and they're like, well, we never see Blanche, but we see baby Jane all the time cavorting around outside and like she is a full on <laughs> ghoul. There's just so it's 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 a wash with horror. Of course, this of course, this gave birth to an entire horror subgenre. As baby Jane Hudson, Betty Davis provided one of the most iconic horror performances of all time. And its influence has been seen in several domestic set horror movies since. Look at Kathy Bates's unhinged performance in misery. Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us. This isn't fair. He didn't get out of the cock a duty car. She's got nowhere to hide as an actress. No. Like every twitch, every line, every smirk or, or mm-hmm. you know anything on her face is absolutely there. Any any wrinkle of her nose, anything mm-hmm. is just there for you to see and she is flawless. And around the same time as Misery in the late 80s and early 90s, we got a glut of domestic set horror movies about psychotic women infiltrating a family home to disrupt the domestic equilibrium. So what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls, you change your number. I mean... I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. From Fatal Attraction to The Hand That Rocks the Cradle to Single White Female. I remember when you announced your season, the first thing that came to mind was single white female, kind of like taking over your life from the inside kind of genre, which I actually, I love. And these films are about a kind of home invasion. They're about women infiltrating a family's home and destroying them from the inside. These women don't fit into those domestic roles. They're independent and career-driven, and therefore they pose a threat to the nuclear family. Inside the kind of perfectly curated bourgeois picture of what a nuclear family should look like, where gender roles are clearly defined and women are expected to devote their entire lives and their entire focus and attention onto the family, keeping the husband happy and the children, you know, well kept, etc. And the house also organized. Yes. Inside that model, to suddenly introduce the inconvenient factor of female subjectivity, female mm-hmm. autonomy, female agency, this gets translated into female desire itself becoming a disturbance, you know, and becoming something that is, you know, actually to be avoided and some something actually breaking in and trashing this beautiful picture. And so the idea of home invasion is actually a lot broader and more varied than we might initially give it credit for. I mean, hell, even one of the most successful family Christmas movies of all time is a home invasion film. <laughs> Give up, or you're thirsty for more. This is the this is the film that kind of set me on the path to loving home invasion films. Uh, I definitely wouldn't be watching those films I, did, I mentioned earlier if it wasn't for Home Alone. Last time I watched it, genuinely, the thing I was so disturbed by is the violence. I was like, I I will happily watch people get chucked into wood chippers at the end of Evil Dead Rise or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then when. Macaulay Culkin is stood on the top of a hotel throwing bricks full force at their heads. Yes. I was watching it just going like, oh, oh my God. They're like brains would be everywhere. I couldn't handle the dissonance between the insane violence and the complete lack of consequences. Weirdly, (laughs) like made it really uncomfortable for me. But finally, what's become of home invasion and horror movies set in the home now? Well, over the last decade, they seem to have proven more popular than ever before. What happened in in 2011 is a shift started to happen. You know, we had Your Next, a film I was so excited about. You see this film sort of playfully being sort of self-aware, but 
with a style that feels a bit grimier, a bit more low budget. The 2010s saw the dawn of streaming platforms like Netflix and Shudder and production companies like Blumhouse, which allowed new indie horror filmmakers to create and release their own low budget, high concept horror films, mostly set in single locations, usually in a domestic space, focusing on a small group of characters under threat. Whether that's Adam Wingard's You're Next, Mike Flanagan's Hush, Mark Duplass's Creep, or James DeMonaco's The Purge. This is your emergency broadcast system, announcing the commencement of the annual purge, sanctioned by the US government. Just the way that they are commenting on America in general, and that kind of like the societal issues that are happening over there and then by doing it through this kind of horror film they can kind of say quite a lot it's the best way to tease out mm. a franchise and a universe isn't it to have something quite high concept um in the in the broadest terms but actually set your film on a very small scale stage within that high concept so yeah we have this rich universe but you don't need to know anything else about that to tell this one small story that this film is about since films like The Purge, we've seen a rise in political and social commentary in horror, and Home Invasion has proven to be the perfect vehicle to comment on class and social inequality. This was none more apparent than in 2019, when a Home Invasion movie won the Oscar for Best Picture. And the Oscar goes to Parasite. I don't think I've been as affected by a film in a very, very long time wow. than I was with this one because it is incredibly dense with symbolism and you can go down that route, you can really look at it and you can be meta about mm -hmm. it. Or you can just watch one heck of a story. Yeah. And that's the thing, it is one heck of a story. Home Invasion seemed to peak in 2019. Beyond films like Us and Parasite, where else could it go? But as it turns out, in the wake of a pandemic and global lockdown, Home Invasion or Home Invasion adjacent movies would continue to be the subgenre through the 2020s. Last year alone saw the release of several home invasion movies, including Barbarian, Speak No Evil, Men, and the terrifying Soft and Quiet. These kind of films tend to surface a lot more when there's a lot going on in the world. Ah, yeah. So, you know, we've had a lot of them recently, and let's face it, since about 2016, the world has gone to hell in the proverbial handbasket, hasn't it? So, I mean, it has, you know, it's yeah. been a very strange and scary place, the world. You know, we saw a lot of them in the early 70s, just after the Manson murders. The horror kind of thrives at its best, I think, when people are anxious about what's going on in the, in the outside world. Yeah. And when you've got sort of things brewing in the outside world that make you feel anxious you retreat to the home yep. and so along come home invasion films to frighten you even more. Right now the world is a pretty scary place things don't seem to be getting any better or less frightening and so naturally there's a temptation for those of us lucky enough to have a roof over our heads to stay inside our homes lock our doors, surround ourselves with our loved ones and our creature comforts and shut off the outside world. And perhaps this is why home invasion is just too stressful for some of us to watch right now if the one place we feel safe is in danger of being violated, what do we have left? The home will always be the most important element in horror cinema. Whether it's an old dark house, a gothic mansion, a small claustrophobic apartment, or a middle-class suburban family house, homes in horror shine a light on humanity. Our fears, our anxieties, our neuroses. Invading our home exposes the most private, hidden, and repressed elements of ourselves. And this is why, for so many, home invasion is the most uncomfortable comfortable, confrontational, and outright terrifying subgenre of all.
And there we have it. Oh my God, what an epic journey it has been. I've loved every single second of it. It's been my favourite season so far of this podcast, bar none. Uh, And I want to thank every single one of my incredible guests who joined me this season. It's our biggest ever guest lineup. And I would like to say one last thanks to each and every one of them. So a big thank you to Kevin Lyons, James Swanton, Rihanna Dillon, Laura Perishon, Alexandra Heller, Nicholas, Jen Handorf, Mark Cousins, Anthony Hudson, Adam Robinson, Axel Carolyn, Stacey Ponder, Jamie Graham, Sam Ashurst, Stevie Webb, Matt Draper, Dan Martin, Becky Dark, Alex West, Maha al Rob Watts, Michael Blythe, Rosie Fletcher, Alex Ailing, Joe Lipsit and Trace Thurman, Louise Blaine, Joshua Tonks, Matt and James from Journey Through Sci-Fi, Christina Newland, Ben Travis, Anna Bogutskaya, Andrea Subasati, Kia Seawert, Alex Austin, James Rendell, Brad Hansen, and Susan Kalman. Holy shit, what an incredible lineup of guests this series and a huge thank you to each and every one of them. I've loved it. And of course, there's one final person I need to say a special thank you to. Somebody who, as ever, has brought her absolute A-game to this series with her incredible insights and her unique perspectives on several of the films covered this season. And she's dropping in to have a little wrap-up chat. So I would like to welcome back to the podcast, the incredible psychoanalyst and cinephile, Mary Wilde. Hello, Mary. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you. How are you? I'm okay. Yeah, I've been really busy, but uh, yeah, I've been really good. (laughs) How has the writing process been for you? You're still busy writing your book, right? Yes, I am. The manuscript deadline is 31st of January. I think I'm going to be able to meet that deadline. I've okay. been writing, you know, progressively. It's been a bit of a painful process, to be honest, but... Oh, God, I bet it's hard. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about this together before. Like, yeah. both of us kind of consider ourselves more kind of talkers than writers, yeah. right? And I know that I I really struggle whenever I have to sit down and write something. But yeah, it must, have been, it must be quite a, a weird kind of adjustment for you doing this. Yeah, it really is. And I was like trying to psychoanalyze myself. Like, why, <laughs> why do I... <laughs> find it so challenging and I think it's because you know it's the finality of the word on the page you know like you have to commit to something and then it's printed it's like a material thing whereas as long as you're like talking into the ether and you're like flowing and never really being pinned down on a podcast um, it has a much more dynamic move you know moving quality to it than black and white on a page printed forever you know so maybe I'm just like a commitment phobe yeah I completely agree with you I'm the same and I feel like whereas I'm happy to kind of say anything and record it and put it out there into the world even though that is equally permanent in a way right yeah there's something about I would agonize over every single sentence I've written and want to (laughs) tweak it and re-edit it do you know what I mean and I think you're absolutely right it's that kind of finality of it isn't Mm -hmm. it yeah yeah exactly so I'm trying to push past that you know that neurotic uh thing in myself yes and you absolutely should because you're an you're an amazing writer mary because everything you you, everything you provide for this podcast is written right i mean you have to write it in order to record it and and send me all your segments so (laughs) it's weird it's not really it's not really that different is it but i i totally get it that sort of psychologically it feels different doesn't it yeah yeah, yeah. It feels like a bigger commitment somehow, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. It really does. <laughs> um, so uh, we just here to quickly wrap up the, the home invasion season. Um, thank you so much for all of your incredible insights once again this season. I've absolutely loved listening to all of thank your segments. You. Uh, how how have you. How have you found it kind of journeying into home invasion? Well, I mean, this is a subgenre that I find compelling and very interesting, but but it can sometimes be frustrating to watch in bulk because yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> be, yes. because a lot of the screen content is homogenous and unchanging. You know, it it's absolutely you know, you're sort of staring at the same thing for a lot of the time. And but I think it convincingly mm. portrays claustrophobia. 
So it is very effective as a horror style. Yeah. And in a way, it made me actually more conscious of my freedom and <laughs> <laughs> give me a new appreciation for mixing it up and leaving my house because I'm such an introvert, like a homebody by nature. So I need the motivation to get out more. Yeah. And so like watching so many home invasion movies, it, it gave me a touch of like cabin fever. So I ended up venturing out more often. <laughs> I think that's such a good point. You're right. And I think because it's been, I, I think it's been my longest series to date on the podcast as well. And and mm. and I think I definitely am ready to have a break from it. And I think that's partly what always, and I find this every time, w- what I've been sort of covering, as much as I love it, I'm always ready to have a break from it by the end of the series and often choose my next series as a kind of antithesis to what what I've chosen (laughs) before, you know? Mm -hmm. And it is, it's claustrophobic and it's just deeply intense, isn't it? Like these movies, we spoke about this at the very beginning, but it is such a troubling subgenre for so many people and such a triggering subgenre. And even the the lighter, more fun ones, they all have something about them, don't they? Where you kind of, you turn off the TV and you do just want to walk out into the fresh air (laughs) for a bit, you know? (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm. It sort of like makes you aware of some things that you've been taken for granted. Mm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Um, what are there any particular highlights for you, Mary, in terms of uh, films that you kind of explored and wrote about? Yes, my all-time favorite film in this subgenre is Mother. Aha! Uh-huh. Yes, <laughs> I thought it might be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I am an Aronofsky super fan and and I just simply adore watching characters go absolutely berserk on screen. Yes, <laughs> yes. And you, you so perfectly and succinctly, basically, it kind of explored everything that that <laughs> film is doing in your segment where the, to the point where I was like, I almost didn't need to go into this any more than you did, really. Like, you you summarised it so perfectly you. in your segment. But yeah, that is such a fascinating movie, isn't it? Because it is... I think it does... It kind of wears its, its themes and its metaphors mm. on its sleeve. But it is just such an exercise in like, anxiety, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, it makes me so anxious and uncomfortable in in the way that it ramps up it's 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 masterfully directed yeah yeah exactly and that's it like it keeps you on edge for so much of the beginning part Mm -hmm. and then it sort of just unravels in the most frantic uncontrolled way that it is actually overwhelming I mean I actually went to see this movie um, for the second time, I'd seen it on my own first in the cinema. And then I was, I told my husband, Paul, I said, oh, you got to come and see this. This is so, it's, I mean, it's just so crazy. And he was like, yeah, and he's not a horror guy. Like he doesn't like watching horror, horror films. So sensitive, bless him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so sweet. And, and he's like, but is it a horror film? Cause you know, I don't like that. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm like, no, it's not a horror film. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? The poor guy, like. Oh my god, it's worse than most traditional horror films. Yeah. Oh my god. And the crazy, so how did he I mean, find it? Well, the crazy thing is that afterwards, so we, like of course for the duration of the movie, he's v- very visibly affected by it. Like he looks very <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. And then we went to see it at Picture House Central. So afterwards we went to get a snack at the you know the, the Tesco in Piccadilly Circus. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the worst Tesco to visit after that film because it was just ram packed full of tourists and he was just <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> like he no. couldn't even walk down the aisle like it was the funniest thing and he was like this is just spilling out into the world like my whole life is gonna become this movie i'm like no don't worry it's oh fine. my god Bless him. Yeah. so yeah probably not the you know the most um well advised uh programming from on my cho- on my <laughs> side but um <laughs> um but in terms of like just you know beyond mother you know i think my favorite film to analyze in this season actually has been creep mm yes because like studying it forensically i realized it it has a very clever internal design like all the puzzle pieces fit so neatly and perfectly yeah that is a fascinating it's such a fascinating character isn't it across two movies such a 
wonderful double bill as well, I think. And, mm. you know, the way in which that character is portrayed and progresses and evolves throughout those two movies, I think it's definitely, it's one that sparks so much conversation amongst listeners as well and amongst my guests. Like, there is something truly magnificent about that character and the way it's performed, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. So A subtle. lot of layers. Yes. And, you know, I really enjoyed listening to your, that kind of late 80s, early 90s, uh, era of movies like Misery and Single White Female as mm. well, right? Like really kind of, I think that's what's been so fun. And we talked about this a little bit in the introduction, but, you know, branching out of the traditional home invasion stuff, but just to talk about people's roles within the home, within a domestic space, whether it's a family's home or a couple's home, going back to all the way to movies like Gaslight, you know, and, and seeing the way in which those interplays kind of play out in, in the kind of horror uh, sphere, you know, it's been so interesting. Yeah, Exactly. And also just seeing how the style is evolving with the with the decades too. Yes, yes. And yeah, it, it, it's also um, like all of those different factors are informing the evolving interior space. And um, yes, and yeah, it is. It's, it's great. I mean, all of them are just they all have something about them and they're all kind of unique. Love this. Uh, it, it's been quite a divisive season so far, I found, like amongst listeners. Some people really love this subgenre. Some people have really hated it, I think. You know, <laughs> uh, why do you think Home Invasion more than any other is the one that kind of really seems to divide people? I think it just might be too sensitive a topic for a lot of us because yeah like the experience of personal boundaries being encroached upon and transgressed is actually very common like not every single person has had their home burgled or invaded but many of us have witnessed you know awkward uncanny things happening inside a house or had like a visitor overstay their welcome. Yes, or, yes. Or even being inside a creepy looking house. Like sometimes disturbing events that are on the more subtle side produce a stronger effect than their extreme counter counterparts. Like it can feel all too real mm-hmm. to engage deeply with home invasion films because it's uncomfortably violating. Yes. Um, but I'm one of the weirdos who finds enjoyment in that kind of thing. So I keep returning to these films. <laughs> Me too. And I really love like movies that are relentlessly kind of uncomfortable. So films like The Invitation and Speak No Evil are some of my mm, oh absolute favourites in that regard. You know, those ones that play with kind of ma- the horror of manners, I guess, and politeness and social etiquette. And I, I found that a really fascinating thing uh, thing throughout this whole season to look at, you know? Yeah, exactly. Because it sort of reminds us that we've all been so careful to construct civilization, you know, the rules of mm-hmm. civilization. As you say, you know, etiquette, manners, common courtesy, um, in especially in a shared space like a house. Yes. And yes. And so when I think horror is just so good, it's so um, adequate for showcasing where that civilization can quickly crumble, and when we see the cracks forming and atrocities being committed in what is supposed to be a sanctuary you know a house Mm -hmm. it just it's it's just too much of a reminder that you know maybe our primordial violent aggressive instincts can always cut through civilization and so it just makes us feel uncomfortable with ourselves you know like what if we're just civilization is really just a defense mechanism against our basic animal urges and instincts and ultimately it will fail because our true colors will be revealed as like you know kind of the aggressors in the situation not the peacemakers um so i think this is that's why it's kind of hard hitting but we don't it's 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 hard hitting and it makes us uncomfortable but i think you know i would argue this is exactly why we should continue to re-engage with the subgenre because we have to confront this mm, yeah it's there like we have to we have to return to it we have to engage in dialogue with it not pretend it doesn't exist completely. because that's where that's where madness lies yeah you know? right exactly i completely <laughs> agree and as much as this has been a hard tough going subgenre there is something kind of cathartic about it sometimes when you get to the other side of it as well you know no matter how mm-hmm. grisly or how depressingly 
some of these movies end, I still kind of feel that sense of relief, relief and catharsis. There's something therapeutic about getting through a home invasion movie intact, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well said, yes. Well, Mary, as ever, it's just been incredible. I've loved all of your segments, your insights. I know the listeners have really enjoyed it. So thank you for joining me again this series. And I already cannot wait to hear what you have to say about next year's topic as well. Great. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me back. Of course. Bring it on. I can't wait. Um, Well, Mary, just in the meantime, let people know where they can find you and more of your work online. Yeah, sure thing. So you can find me on social media at Psychstar. The, the handle is the same on all platforms. I also produce exclusive content on Patreon. And also now I'm going to be collaborating with a fantastic organization, Morbid Anatomy in New York. And we're producing a new online course that starts in February on erotic cinema. So for your more amorous listeners out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. This might be one for them. So you can check those details out on my on, on my social media. I love it. I saw that uh, your little trailer for it on social media actually got, <laughs> didn't it get censored on social media or something? Yes. yes. <laughs> Yes, it did. Yes, it was It was too much for Twitter to handle. So. Too, literally too hot to handle. I love it. I love it. Incredible. Um, well, Mary, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Mike. A big thank you to the wonderful Mary Wilde. And of course, Mary will be back next season. I cannot wait. Okay, so we're going to finish this week's episode and we're going to finish this series by dipping into the mailbag. I'm going to read a bit of feedback, some audience responses to this home invasion season, and then we're going to count down the listeners' top 10 home invasion movies. So thank you all so much for your emails. I do read every email that comes in, and I am sorry if I can't always reply to every single one of you but everyone who emails me to evolutionofhorror at gmail.com you know I do read every email that comes into that Uh, and actually on that note you know I will say the best way to get in contact with me is via that email address Um, some of you you know people do obviously DM me on social media on Instagram and Twitter and that kind of thing people leave me comments on YouTube as well to be honest a a lot of the time I, I end up kind of losing those messages and comments I don't always get a chance to read them it's very easy for me to just lose track of message requests sometimes I don't see them so if there is anything that you actually want to get in touch with me about or you want me to read I would always recommend going email over you know Instagram messages or Twitter messages or YouTube comments or anything like that or the other way you can do it is on the evolution of horror discussion group if you're on that group and you tag me in a post I will always read it as well and a lot of people do that in order to interact with me which is great so those are the two best ways to get in touch with me so a huge thank you to everybody who sent in your feedback I'm going to pick out a handful of emails and read some of this feedback now so uh, this email comes from Andrew Andrew Barber. Andrew says, Hi Mike, thank you for another great series. I loved the loose definition taking us to some interesting places in the parlance of our times. It's been a journey. Even shoehorn some Tarantino in there. However, I am not concerned about an actual home invasion, but many of the films have definitely reaffirmed my terror of socialising. I mean, going to a dinner party horrifying. I'll be home alone watching movies when the invaders come. Peace and love, Andrew. Love that. Yeah, I'm glad that people, a lot of people out there have emailed me uh, sharing my fear of dinner party horror. I'm glad we're all on the same wavelength there. Uh, This feedback came from uh, Reed in Santa Fe. Reed says, Hello Mike, as with many, I was a little concerned coming into the home invasion season due to my prior experience with this subgenre. I loved the way you have expanded it, however, and place the idea of horror in the home at the forefront instead of simply centering on the invasion. Additionally, I was surprised at how many of these films I had seen prior to the episodes. Many of these films are considered some of the most extreme films ever made, so my need to revisit wasn't as high as I thought it might be, as many of these films made a lasting impression the first time I saw them. Personal highlights for me were Lady in a Cage and Soft and Quiet. It was also great to revisit The People Under the Stairs for the first time since the theatre 30 years ago. But nothing, no matter where this podcast goes in the future, will ever touch the in-depth discussion of the most important horror film ever made, Home Alone. Thanks, Mike. Have a safe and happy holiday season. 
Love this. Um, <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for being so kind about the Home Alone episode. Um, I think I mentioned at some point on an episode that I got a few angry comments from people. I mean, it's fine. This happens every year. I got a couple of uh, snooty people being cross about us covering Twilight during the Vampire series. I think it was those same people, really, that didn't like that I was covering Home Alone this series. But you know, we can ignore those people. It's fine. Uh, this feedback comes from Aaron. Aaron says, I've enjoyed this season. It's definitely not my favourite subgenre, but I really liked that you approached it more as domestic horror rather than brutal and fairly repetitive traditional home invasion stuff. However, as the season has included such a disparate and wide-ranging selection of films, it's meant that I'm finding it very hard to pick my top ten. Each film, in turn, leads to more subjects, themes, sub-subgenres and film options that were worthy of inclusion if only you could have found room and dragged out the season for another year or two. Now I'm torn between suggesting some favourite great films that weren't included and trying to hustle a mention for them on the pod or picking from the cool films that actually made it onto the season and I'll go with a mix of both for my top 10. Lastly, do you think the two films per show structure could potentially be limiting the discussion? There were a few times this season when a wider ranging multi-film approach might have worked better to discuss how these films actually evolved e.g. all the copycat versions of Last House on the Left, or the chilly UK psych psychological thrillers of the 60s and 70s, like The Collector and The Birthday Party, etc. Or even an episode bundling all the films where someone's secretly living in the house already. Bad Ronald, Cruel Space, etc. I can see why you wouldn't give most of these films their own episode, but maybe you could have worked them in as a themed bundle. Thanks, Mike. Uh, cheers, Aaron. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that feedback. Um, <clears throat> well, to answer your question... I just simply don't have the time and the brain capacity to watch like eight to ten movies per episode. To be honest, sometimes I think two films per episode is a bit much and I've thought about whether or not it's worth going back to one uh, film per episode. So no, I, 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 I understand why you might suggest such a thing. But the idea of me and making my guest watch kind of, you know, eight to 10 to 12 movies for a single discussion, is just not really viable. I think it, I think it takes up too much time and too much prep. And then, you know, the alternative is we don't actually watch them. We just list off a reel of titles and synopses. But then where's the fun in that, really? You know, like you kind of the, the, the point of this podcast is that it's supposed to be that me and my guests have seen the films so that we can interpret them and analyze them and give our own perspective of them um, rather than just read kind of IMDb synopses. So I think as much as I would love to be able to do something like that, Aaron, I think just having the capacity of, you know, covering a theme every week or every other week that involves, you know, like, you know, tens and tens of movies is just not really viable. I, I like to stick to this podcast really has always been much more about the deep dives. We do one also rands per season, just as a little bonus extra, really. But this podcast is really about the deep dive discussions of two and sometimes even just one film. So, um, and But I understand that this season has been particularly broad, and I hope that that means that there's room for people to go off and, and do their own research and find other movies that we haven't covered this season. Um, but thank you so much for that uh, feedback, Aaron. Uh, this comes from Ellie. Ellie said, Hi, Mike. I've loved this season. It's been my favourite so far. My only feedback would be that I thought the beginning eight to ten movies uh, didn't appeal to me much, but I don't rate super old movies, to be honest. I would have preferred less of those and more of the recent ones. But I totally get that's part and parcel of showing the evolution of the genre. So no criticism for you personally. Uh, thank you, Ellie, for that feedback. I am going to uh, counterbalance that feedback with this bit of feedback from Nathaniel, who said, Hi, Mike. I've loved everything this season until we got to the more contemporary films, which I find less interesting in general. I was very pleased that the show didn't give itself strict rules for what home invasion was and covered a diverse range of films. I was very pleased that Munzer found such joy in Lady in a Cage as it's been one of my favourites for a long time. Oh, I loved Lady in a Cage so much. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, so there you go. You see, you've got 
some people that wish I did more old movies, some people that wish I did more new movies. Hopefully we managed to strike a good balance there. But uh, this is the thing. I was talking about this recently when I, I hosted a quiz last week, a Christmas quiz. And um, you always get some people that say that they really struggle with, you know, quiz rounds that are about older stuff. And then vice versa. Some people, you know, say that I'm too biased towards including quiz questions that are based on newer movies. And it's a really difficult thing. There are so many different types of horror fans out there. There are people that love the vintage stuff, the Hammer Horror, MR James, you know, TV, British horror. Then there are people that love all the kind of weird and wonderful 70s and 80s, you know, uh, straight to video kind of grindhousey stuff. And then there are people that only love kind of modern stuff and, you know, haven't seen a lot of old movies. So it's always a difficult thing on this particular podcast, striking the balance that you cover enough movies and dip your toe into enough eras and enough areas of the subgenre to cover kind of give a little bit of something to everyone. So hopefully I've managed that this season. Uh, This comes from Tony. Tony says, Hi Mike, Home Invasion is the most uncomfortable genre for me and not one I rush to watch. However, it makes for excellent story tension and classic good versus evil. Mike did a wonderful job of showcasing the range of Home Invasion. This would have been a polarising season if it had been all bleak ending films. I appreciate that the season stretched the different definition of Home Invasion invasion which led to films that wouldn't have gotten exposure otherwise i also love when new guests are introduced for example andrea subasati whose commentary along with mike could soften the deeply disturbing speak no evil love that thank you tony yeah it was absolute joy for me to finally get andrea subasati on the podcast um i loved that episode where we got to discuss the invitation and speak no evil two of my favorite films of all time and i got such lovely feedback on that particular episode so uh big thank you to everybody who listened and enjoyed that episode uh this feedback comes from craig he says hello mike when the season was announced i was worried that 30 plus episodes of a very specific type of horror would get old the choice of films and liberal interpretation of Home Invasion, however, kept it fresh with some huge tonal swings. Mother to bodies, bodies, bodies in one week. That always kept me engaged. It also may have the highest level of perfect films of any season, from Sunset Boulevard to Parasite. So different with 70 years separating them, but both unbelievable movies. Oh, thank you, Craig. I completely agree with you on that. I think this is why it's been my favourite season to do so far. I really love seasons where the films are a bit more varied and I got to pick so many legit masterpieces to cover this season, which was it was so exciting. Each and every week felt really exciting. No week felt like filler to me, um, which I've loved. Uh, this comes from Bo. Bo says, Hi Mike, this might well be my favourite season yet. The guests, the discussions, the mixture of movies, Home Alone annoying people, and as always, Mike Munzer. Going into it, I wasn't sure how I regarded the subgenre, but I've really enjoyed some of the films covered and made some great discoveries, like The Old Dark House, Gaslight, and Lady in a Cage. Thank you so much, Bo, for that lovely message. Uh, this message came from Dahlgren. Uh, they say, Hello Mike, this This season was fantastic. So amazingly organised. I haven't listened to every single episode because I like to save spoilers for the movies I really want to watch. And I haven't been able to see and or I have been too scared to watch certain films until I find the perfect time. But I have listened to about 70% of the season and it's easily been my favourite subgenre you've done so far because I think the flexible way in which you've approached Home Invasion has opened up the discussion to a lot of weird genre films that are more focused on bizarre human interactions and weird slow burn psychological unfoldings which are my absolute favorite kinds of movies movies that are just a bit weird and I don't always know where they're going the one thing I listened to that really made me laugh a bit to myself was your discussion on creep which I loved when you and your guest kept insisting that until the end Joseph was basically displaying beige flags that could go either way of him being a madman or not and I really had to chuckle because from my female perspective perspective it was just glaring red flag after glaring red flag and there was no way that that man was not going to murder someone 
Wow, thank you. That is so interesting, isn't it? The the perspectives there from men and women when it comes to some of these stories and some of these home invasion movies is is so interesting. And you're absolutely right. You know, like I'm sure that would play out so differently that movie to women as opposed to a couple of you know white dudes like it did to me and my guest. But that's yeah, that's really really fascinating. Thank you, Dahlgren, for that uh, message. Uh, this comes from Jay Wright. Jay says, "Hello, Mike. I've never considered my myself much of a home invasion fan and while I have to admit that this season hasn't changed that it has given me a new appreciation for the versatility and inventiveness of the subgenre and for how the theme of home invasion seems to crop up everywhere in horror when you start looking for it I keep looking at my favorite movies and thinking has this secretly been a home invasion the whole time maybe I am a fan after all that said I was a little disappointed that your also rans episode neglected the old dark house sub sub genre that was touched on occasionally in this season. And so I'd like to recommend a personal favourite, Arsenic and Old Lace from 1944, directed by Frank Capra, which sees Cary Grant desperately trying to resolve a small domestic matter involving his adorable elderly aunts and a dead body in their window seat. Just when you think things can't get any weirder, his malevolent brother Jonathan breaks into the house with a corpse of his own and refuses to leave. The film is based on a stage play of the same name, the original cast of which featured none other than Boris Karloff as Jonathan uh, in the film The Role That Goes to Raymond Massey. All told, it's a very funny movie that also goes to some pretty dark places. Perfect for an October afternoon. Thanks for another great season, James. Thank you so much, Jay, for that lovely message. And yeah, I've seen Arsenic and Old Lace. You're right, it probably should have been mentioned or included at some point, but I'm a big fan of that movie. It's so much fun, absolutely worth checking out if there's anyone out there who hasn't seen it it. Uh, This message came from Vanessa. Hi Mike, now that the series is over, what a great series it's been. I have really enjoyed my first full real-time follow-along with the show. My favourite home invasion movies not covered on the show in depth are The Exterminating Angel, still my ultimate nightmare scenario, the party that won't end, Arsenic and Old Lace, there we go, Uh, The Perfect Hose, Pacific Heights, House of Long Shadows, Villains, Intruders, Violent night and both versions of cape fear my votes for the best home invasion horror mentioned on the show would be lady in a cage a clockwork orange you're next parasite the guest and the old dark house can't wait to hear what the next season will bring Uh, thank you so much for that email Vanessa and yes so many of you guys emailed with kind of additional films that I need to check out so many good films fit uh, this subgenre and I've got so much stuff that I still need to catch up on in the future this one came from Connor so we got a couple of negative ones here here's one from Connor Uh, Connor says hi Mike it's been a bit of a strange season to be honest many of my favorite genre films are within the parameters of home invasion cinema but there was a lack of specificity to the genre elements of the season that rendered the dissection of home invasion to be somewhat haphazard as a whole. Many individual episodes tackled their specific films with grace and intellectual rigour, but when taken as a single experience, I don't think this season offered much to be gleaned about the home invasion subgenre as a whole. There is a perennial lack of thesis about home invasion throughout the season. I felt that compared to seasons where the subgenre defining elements were more explicit, e.g. vampires, zombies, aliens, etc., that this season had the hard work of attempting to thread the thematic needle through films that don't necessarily share in the same DNA. It adds to the befuddlement about the season that films like The Slumber Party Massacre cropped up here, but not in the slasher season, bringing into question what exactly the home invasion genre is if movies like Slumber Party Massacre are included in it, or films like A Clockwork Orange, which feature two home invasions but is demonstrably not about the home in any real capacity. I kept wondering if the season was just horror movies involving homes, which isn't really super compelling to me but the podcast isn't made specifically for me so it feels dumb to complain about all this stuff as i said i really love a lot of the episodes angst and henry and both the funny games films uh on individual levels the episodes in this season are some of my favorite from the entire catalog but the season as a whole left me wanting you're fabulous mike just trying to be super honest much love thank you connor for that message here's another similar one from lawrence which i'll read back to back with it he said hi mike while i've loved 
loved most of the films covered this season, I've been disappointed by the lack of through lines. I've got to say, I personally prefer your seasons that focus on more defined subgenres like slashers, ghosts, zombies and vampires. The more amorphous topics that you explore, like folk horror, mind and body and now home invasion, tend to lack a coherent through line across the seasons as a whole, which undermines your excellent podcast format. Having said that, I've still really enjoyed listening to each individual episode and discussion, with your discussions of Lady in a Cage and Funny Games being the two absolute highlights for me. Keep up the great work. Can't wait for your 10th season. Thank you, Lawrence. I mean, I totally get that feedback from both of you. I think you're absolutely right. There is less of a recurring uh, kind of series of tropes in each of the movies that we cover this season. And I, that's deliberate. I mean, that is absolutely deliberate. Like, I, I, And I guess, you know, this comes down to personal taste. I personally have enjoyed less the seasons that are really, really rigid in terms of their sort of subgenre parameters. So you guys listed the zombie series, the slasher series. These are not my favourites that I've been through. These, these were the ones where by the end I was very much ready to take a break from them because they were very much the same kind of format over and over again. My favourite seasons personally have been the ones that Lawrence said that he didn't like so much. So folk horror, mind and body and home invasion the because they were all a little bit more loose they were kind of slightly more you know they did they didn't really have a lot of tropes that defined them so i could have a bit more fun in playing with what that is and and kind of what i want this podcast to be is to be an open forum to discuss things like that because to be honest sub genres are made up right even the horror genre is made up. You know, the whole point of this podcast really is to talk about what defines a horror movie. That's why I'm always asking that question. That's why I'm always saying, is this a horror movie? Is this a horror movie? We, as audience members and fans, make up these definitions, you know, and I saw potential here uh, to cover a lot of movies that actually I think do include a lot of stylistic and thematic similarities. You know, movies set... Uh, particularly about human beings. There are no monsters here. Uh, There is no supernatural element, particularly human stories about human beings in domestic settings. I felt like there is a through line there. Uh, You know, there's no definitive correct answer to what is or isn't in a certain subgenre. So I I include movies that are slightly left field in order to open that discussion. But part of why I included the Slumber Party Massacre in this season is firstly because it's fun, Uh, it's a fun movie to discuss, and also because it was about that era in the early 80s when home invasion and slashers were starting to merge and become one, thanks to Black Christmas and Halloween. So we did When a Stranger Calls, which is, you know, about a, a teenage girl alone in the house, she's getting phone calls, she's a babysitter, the killer's upstairs. That's a film that people would consider home invasion and not slasher, right? And then where did that lead to? It led to the slasher boom. Slumber Party Mass is slightly different to the other slashers because there isn't a killer with a mask. It's just a guy. It's predominantly set in one location. It focuses more on the characters in the home than it does on a vast body count. So I think there was an interesting blurry line there. And of course, a lot of people would consider this a slasher movie and not a home invasion. Absolutely. But in which case, tell me why. You know, the point of that is to engage and uh, spark a discussion. Well, then what does make a slasher film? What doesn't? What makes a home invasion movie different to a slasher when you're talking about men come breaking into homes and killing women with a weapon? Um, so <clears throat> every every film that was included this series, even ones that didn't fit rigidly within the subgenre, were about how they may or may not be connected to it. It's the same with all of those erotic thrillers of the late 80s and early 90s. Again, I got a lot of feedback from people who weren't happy or disagreed with me including them. But I think, well, why not discuss that and the similarities and the parallels, particularly between those and the kind of women's pictures of the 40s, for example. And yes, of course, all of these subgenres do blend and merge again, because there are no strict definitions really as to what a different particular subgenre is. If I was going to be really strict about zombie movies, I wouldn't have included 28 Days Later. But of course, it's a zombie movie. Like we push and we stretch these definitions and we explore different types of movies and we discuss how and why they might fit in with certain others. 
I think that's part of the fun of having a discussion podcast. Um, but of course, we all have different interpretations of this. And I and I knew going into this, and I knew with this particular list of movies that some people weren't going to be happy about it. Um, hopefully, the next season you might find it's a little bit more thematically coherent. Let's see what you think. Um, here are a couple of good emails. Now, throughout this uh, season, I have been asking people, my guests, for their own uh, kind of experiences of home invasions as well. And so many of you guys emailed in with your own stories, some of them very scary stories about stuff that's happened to you, like home invasion or break-in situations. So I thought I'd read a couple of these just as part of the discussion. This email comes from Murray. Uh, Murray says, Hello Mike, congratulations on your Herculean season of the podcast and one which covered such a diverse range of films. While I know you have had some pushback regarding and including films like Home Alone or Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, their influence can be felt across the subgenre, so it was worth having a spot for them to be discussed. One of the most interesting parts of this season for me was hearing your guests' real-life encounters with home invasions. Without wanting to blend true crime with horror, Andrea Supersati wrote a great piece on why we shouldn't, hearing how real-life experiences shaped their tastes was very illuminating. I had a situation which shifted my relationship with this subgenre a decade ago. It was a sunny Saturday morning in my Glasgow flat when I heard a woman's scream from the communal stairwell. I ran to check if everything was all right, only to see a woman and two men look up at me, yelling, get that cunt, and charging up the stairs. I quickly closed my door and put my body weight behind it to stop them getting in. One of them put his hand through my letterbox, so I grabbed a kitchen knife I was using and had it hovering above his hand. If he moved up, the knife would sink in. I decided then to hide behind the door so if they did get in I could run away. But then that reptilian part of my brain crept in and I thought I won't have time to run. Should I fight and who should I attack first? It brings me no joy to relive the fact that I had to even consider hurting someone and that's why this genre works for me. It was not them getting into my flat that scared me, it's what my response would be. Needless to say, my favourite home invasion film is Straw Dogs. Keep up the great work. Cheers, Murray. Oh my God, thank you for that um, email and that story, Murray. That is genuinely terrifying. And you're right, you know, like I think Straw Dogs is obviously one of those big, big... um, films in this subgenre that we didn't cover because I've already covered it in folk horror. Hence, there's me going back to my previous point about how all these subgenres kind of all cross over anyway. But I think you're right about that. One of the really scary things about home invasions is what you, how far you would go to protect your home and protect yourself, right? That idea of kind of like we're all actually just like aggressive animals just under the surface there, you know, and it doesn't take much to kind of let that side of humanity out is a very, very scary thing that I think is what makes uh, home invasion such a kind of... Um, such an uncomfortable subgenre for so many of us. Uh, this email comes from Peter, Peter Jetnikoff. He says, hello, Mike. Really enjoyed the home series as it went in so many different directions and allowed a lot of stretching the boundaries. Yes, I enjoyed the Home Alone ep. I don't know if you were asking for listeners' experiences, but here's one of mine which still makes me think. I've lived in inner city Melbourne for decades now and have had my share of burglaries and break-ins. The weirdest thing, though, was being woken at about three in the morning by the sound of my metal porch gate. It's so distinctive that it can wake me even when carefully lifted. I then heard someone making the clicking noise trying to pick my lock on the front door. I went down and slammed my hand into the door right where they'd been listening and yelled, I've called the cops. A low drunken groan came through, but then silence. I checked from my balcony they'd gone. Two months later, I was lying awake and I heard the gate latch lift with audible care. A few seconds later, they pulled at the metal security screen. I'd started locking myself in from the last time. It clunked, still locked. Then silence. The thing is, if that was the same person as last time, and something tells me it was, they were trying to get in knowing there was someone home. 
Sleep tight, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> oh my god, Peter, thank you for that story. This is horrible. I apologise. I should have offered some sort of trigger warning to people before reading these uh, emails because these are some genuinely frightening stories. Um, I'm sorry that that happened to you. That's uh, pretty scary stuff. And you're right. I think that idea of the same person coming back a second time and it not just being a kind of I don't know, drunken opportunist, but maybe somebody who knows you're there and is still trying to break in. That's a pretty horrible thought, yeah. Uh, this email comes from Richard Rowe. Richard says, Hey Mike, thank you as always for a great and mammoth series, and I promise not to mention the neglect of the collector again. We covered the collector, didn't we, Richard? Didn't we? Or was it the collection? We definitely covered one of those films. Anyway, sorry. Uh, I thought I would briefly share my own home invasion tale, which is actually a tent invasion. Way back in 1997, I was at the hideously and notoriously muddy Glastonbury Festival. On the Saturday night after the majestic radio headset, I suddenly woke up for some reason in my tent in the early hours of the morning, just as the sun was rising. I was aware of something not being right, so I bolted upright in my sleeping bag, only to find a silhouetted figure at the end of my small tent, rifling through my bags and belongings. As soon as he realised I was awake, he scrambled out of the tent as quickly as he could. Adrenaline took over and I lunged for his feet and grabbed hold of him. He continued to try getting away and scrambled out of the tent, dragging me, half naked, out of my sleeping bag along with him, clinging to his legs. I was able to leverage enough strength to buckle his legs and he fell to the ground. I jumped on top of him as he protested his innocence, but then I quickly realised the futility of my situation, that there was nothing to be gained by pinning him down and not even wearing any clothes, with no security around or any assistance. So I just let him go, weakly shouting, and don't do it again, <laughs> as he ran off before realising how dangerous it could have been if he had had any weapons on him. I'm not expecting a filmed dramatisation of this brief encounter anytime soon, and thankfully haven't had a similar experience in my home, but I'm just grateful I'd kept my wallet in my sleeping bag and he only made off with a cheap camera. Keep up the great work and look forward to the next season. Oh, Richard, thank you for that. That's, um, again... A horrible scary story isn't it you know something about a small confined space like that as well and actually you know I know other people that have had this kind of thing happen to them at Glastonbury and other festivals I guess it can easily happen right when you've got all of your belongings in a tent and you've got a lot of drunken people you know wandering around you know seizing opportunities but yeah that idea of waking up and actually just seeing a figure at the foot of your bed in your tent that is pretty frightening. And I, I, you know, I'm kind of surprised slash, I guess, impressed at how many of you guys actually just like out and out go for it in terms of just like seizing these invaders and trying to get them as opposed to just running and hiding, which is what I think I would do. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that story, Richard. And thank you for that email. Um, there are so many more emails uh, that I got from loads of you with feedback, positive and negative, but sadly, I'm not going to have time to read any more of it out on this episode, but I do always really appreciate hearing from you guys, so thank you so, so much for getting in touch. And a big thank you to all of you that also sent in your top 10 home invasion movies, and we are now going to finish this episode and this season by running through the listeners' top 10 home invasion films. So, we had hundreds of of you send in your list as usual with every year I have collated the results and come up with a final and definitive top 10 so for each top 10 that was sent in by each individual I ranked them accordingly where your number one picks got 10 points your number 10 picks got one point and everything else in between was scored accordingly uh, and we tallied up the results and we've now got our final list so let's kick things off with your number 10 home invasion movie and that is the brilliant Speak No Evil from 2022. Hi, April. Abel has some difficulty speaking. He has what you call congenital aglossia, meaning basically he's born without a tongue. Abel, I've got this. Hey, Abel! He's only a child, for Christ's sake. You can't talk to him that way. What is wrong with you? 
Oh, God. I mean, I've already talked about how much of a personal favourite this is of mine. I put this as my number one film of last year. Last year being, I think, one of the strongest years for horror that we've had in a very long time. But this movie was the top of the list for me. I absolutely love it. It's so frightening. It's one of the few movies I can remember in my life in which I had to switch the film off and just go for a walk outside in the fresh air because it really fucked with me. So I'm so glad you guys enjoyed it too. I'll read a few comments from you guys. Vincent Gay says speak no evil a deeply uncomfortable ferociously tense and thoroughly terrifying psychological horror of manipulation escalating aggressions and social appropriation Uh, Sarah says the only movie I can think of that's made me this uncomfortable is Whiplash from 2014 but even that film I got through it in one sitting I had to watch speak no evil in four different sittings as someone who struggles with over politeness and has a huge fear of confrontation this movie got under my skin in a very real way audrey says a great cautionary tale for people like me (laughs) annika says quite simply the most stressful claustrophobic and anxiety inducing movie experience i've ever had I will never watch this movie again. Uh, And Daniel says, very few movies leave a mark and an impact on me, and this really did. The disturbing feeling and nature through the entire movie, the fantastic performances by all the actors, this film really struck a nerve with me, and I think about it a lot. There we go. A big thank you to all of those comments, and that is your number 10 home invasion movie of all time. A fantastic choice. It's going to be a future all-time classic as far as I'm concerned. That is Speak No Evil from 2022. Up to your number nine then, and this is much more of a kind of beloved, famous movie in this subgenre. At number nine, you guys voted for The Strangers from 2008. Hi. Hello. Is Tamara here? No. No, you got the wrong house. You sure? Yeah. I'm sorry. See you later. This was actually one of my favourite discussions of the series, actually. I loved having uh, Trace and Joe from Horror Queers to discuss The Strangers and its sequel, because it's never been a personal favourite of mine, but I really, really appreciated their insights into the film, and I really enjoyed discussing it. There's a lot of really interesting elements to this film to discuss, and I love that you guys put it in your top ten. Peter Jetnikoff says, As basic as it gets, but all the more powerful for it exactly that nelly said the strangers it's exactly what you think of when you think of the worst kind of home invasion it's relentless thought-provoking and nasty uh eli says because you were home is honestly one of the most chilling quotes from any movie i've ever watched even years on the first time i watched the strangers is still burned into my brain the focus on villains who are interested in violence for the sake of violence without any other tangible reason is haunting and andrea says I know this film gets a bit of a bad rap these days, but I rewatched it this year for the first time since seeing it in the theatre back in 2008, and I found it every bit as taut, terrifying, and masterfully directed as I did 15 years ago. For me, this is home invasion in its purest form. There you go. Thank you for those comments. And I kind of agree with you guys. You know, I think I feel like if I wanted to show somebody what home invasion is in its absolute purest form, I probably would show them The Strangers. This is it, right? This is kind of the movie we all think about, for better or worse, that kind of represents this subgenre. And it's interesting then, in that regard, that it isn't kind of higher on your list, really. And this has been a really fascinating top 10, because with so many subgenres, I'm kind of able to predict what the number one is before anyone votes, you know? Like, obviously with folk horror, it was going to be The Wicker Man. Obviously with slashes, it was going to be Halloween. Obviously with occult movies, it was going to be The Exorcist, etc. But this one was way harder to call. I had absolutely no idea what you guys would end up voting for. And, you know, if I was going to go for the most iconic home invasion film... I would have thought The Strangers would have been higher up in your list, but it's only at number nine. So there you go. That is your number nine pick. That's The Strangers from 2008. Up to number eight now, and another modern gem. It's Adam Wingard's You're Next from 2011. 
Simple as that. Oh, I love this film. And actually, I don't think I was aware until covering it on the podcast just how much of a firm favourite this is amongst horror fans. So many of you guys voted for this film. So many of you guys got in touch to talk about how this is one of your absolute favourite films in the subgenre. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think outside of horror circles, not many people know about this film. It still feels a little bit more niche compared to something like The Strangers. But among horror fans, it's an absolute all-timer for so many of you. Uh, Matt says, if The Strangers is the ultimate example of the bleak and downbeat home invasion movie, your next is the best example of the opposite. A fun, satisfying watch that doesn't hold back on brutality and nastiness, but still has plenty of cathartic violence in the final act as a result of one of the best final girls in horror cinema history. Love that. And James says, more brutal and less fluffy than most teen slashers, but more fun and less nihilistic than home invasion films. Your next perfectly straddles the line between those two subgenres and it masterfully guides horror into a new decade and new golden age. Uh, Ellie says, I watched this off the back of listening to the podcast and I loved it. It was so enjoyable and a great find, really fun, although I did see the twist coming. Uh, and finally, Julia says, there's not enough love going out to this film and the badass of our protagonist got to love a home invasion movie where you can use some simple tips and tricks to fuck up some home invaders nails in boards genius <laughs> incredible uh yeah what a fun movie it's a really rewatchable home invasion movie this one isn't it that's what i love it's a very easy movie to pop on and have a lot of fun with plus it's got barbara crampton i mean what could go wrong so there you go that's your number eight in your top 10 that is adam wingard's your next now i'm very excited about what you guys voted for as number seven this was a movie that got brought up probably more than any other film in your feedback emails uh, and it was a first time discovery for so many of you as it was for me, at number seven, you guys voted for Lady in a Cage. Help! Help! Please help! I am trapped in small private elevator. <laughs> I know a lot of you guys have heard me waffle on about how much I fell in love with this film after watching it for the first time this season. And it really has stuck out to me as one of the all-time great discoveries I've made as a result of making this podcast. I absolutely love this film. How is it that more people aren't talking about this film as an all-time classic? That's what I want to know. But I'm so glad that so many of you guys agree. Uh, Nathaniel said, The One, The Only. The movie that slipped past local television censors on the regular and was played on on American television all throughout the conservative reactionary 80s with its gore intact. Not only is it a fantastic film, it's an anti-censorship groundbreaker. Carl says, easily the best find of the season for me. I continue to be surprised it's not better known. Nick says, oh my word, what a fantastic find this season. Surprisingly creepy, weird and wild for an early 60s studio movie with unexpected observations on suburban isolation. Much to enjoy here would never have watched it if it wasn't on the podcast mr waffles says the best surprise of the season trina says it took me completely by surprise at how much i loved this film claustrophobic tense and atmospheric more fantastic performances i genuinely found james khan intimidating and scary so so happy to be able to add this solid gold classic to my horror library aaron says this and angst were the two new to me films this season that really blew me away. Sean says, this was when I really clocked what you were going for with this season, Mike. The way in which the film owed a debt to exploitation, the women's pictures of the 40s and the old dark house format, whilst also feeling like a new kind of violent, 
modern day social satire, the likes of which we would see through the 1970s. It makes it the perfect EOH discovery for me. And finally, Maria says, not only my favourite film covered this season, but my favourite episode too. When are Mike and Stacey Ponder going to start their own weekly podcast together? <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for all of those comments. God, I would love to have my own weekly uh, podcast with Stacey Ponder. Podcasting with her is absolutely one of the most fun things to do. And if people haven't checked them out, do listen to some of our Patreon episodes episodes uh, if you sign up to Patreon. There's a two-part special in which me and Stacey count down the patrons top 50 horror movie performances and it is such a fun chat with Stacey. Um, Stacey FYI will be back on Patreon very very soon as in in the next couple of weeks. So any Stacey fans out there get involved, sign up to our Patreon. So that's your number seven. I'm so glad you guys loved it as much as me. That's Lady in a Cage. At number six, an all-timer, a big old classic, this one. It's Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. We fill it around for a while with other travellers of the night, playing hogs of the road. Then we headed west. What we were after now was the old surprise visit. That was a real kick and good for laughs and lashings of the old ultra-violent. I mean, what is there to say about this film? I, I absolutely love this film. It's an all-timer as far as I'm concerned. Nelly says, this film has... <laughs> this is funny. This film has a lot to do with my taste in men. McDowell, with that evil, playful look in his eyes, phew, does things that it shouldn't. Could do without him being so rapey, though. Yeah, I agree with that, Nelly. I agree with that. Uh, Brendan says, I probably watched this film a little too young the first time I saw it, even at 14, but it became one of those few movies that changed what potential cinema could have as a movie lover, and that there were boundless worlds of movies to discover. That a part of cinema is also about pushing boundaries. Some, sometimes you'd rather weren't touched upon, and is about testing yourself, what you can take, and how much of it. Perfectly put, Brendan. I agree with that. And I have the exact same experience. You know, I watched this too young, but it really opened my eyes to what cinema could be. You know, um, it really kind of opened doors and led me to seek out more kind of controversial boundary pushing movies off the back of it. Uh, this comment from Nick, a brilliant realisation of a great book by Kubrick with an iconic performance by Malcolm McDowell. Glad to see him in the top 50 performances as disturbing today as it was back in the day. So much to unpack. Jameis says, I didn't see this film until EOH did this series. I never avoided it. It just almost mystically got by me all these years. The good news, I loved it. And it's become one of my top 20 horror classics. The deadpan delivery at times of McDowell's narration, juxtaposed with the shocking horror on screen, works to deliver the chills. So good and not overrated. Uh, and this from Keith, I love the language and the way he eats his eggy wegs. The penis sculpture scene is a perfect blend of funny and frightening. Yeah, completely agree with every single comment there. I love that film. I mean, it's an all-timer, isn't it? That's your number six, that's Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Into the top five then, and these picks are just getting more and more exciting. You guys have great taste. At number five, it's Karen Kasama's The Invitation. Something doesn't feel safe here. We don't see you for two years, and then all of a sudden, we get invited to this lavish dinner. Don't tell me that this is normal. Obviously, this is one of my personal all-time favourite movies, uh, one of the best horror movies of the last decade, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Juliet says, Is there anything scarier than an adult dinner party where the attendees are all grown up and sophisticated and forced to perform fitting into a group? From its earliest moments, this group of shiny, happy people freaked me out, and those red lights in the LA hills at the end of the film, chilling. Vincent says a deeply atmospheric and thoroughly unsettling domestic horror of social manners, threatening spaces, friendships and grief. Seth says, the, I love this, Seth says the exact opposite of situational comedy. 
That is exactly right, Seth. It's situational tragedy, right? It is uh, so horrible to sit through. Tom says, Your decision to include this film alongside Speak No Evil as part of the Home Invasion series was inspired. Much like the best Home Invasion films, the invitation is bleak, terrifying, deeply uncomfortable, and you sort of just want it to end. (laughs) Plus, it does end with possibly the most chilling final shot in cinema history. Yeah, couldn't agree more with all of those sentiments. What an incredible film. So glad you guys agree. Your number five, Karen Kasama's The Invitation. Up to number four then, and this is an absolute all-timer, a genuine classic, an Oscar-winning film for its lead actress. And number four, you guys voted for Rob Reiner's Misery. And don't even think about anybody coming for you. Not the doctors, not your agent, not your family because I never called them. Nobody knows you're here. And you better hope nothing happens to me. Because if I die, you die. Love this movie so much. I think it's probably my favourite Stephen King adaptation other than The Shining. And I loved discussing this film with Becky Dark on the podcast as well. So much fun. Uh, Bo says, This is the ultimate domestic set horror movie. The penguin scene alone warrants its inclusion. Kathy Bates is a tour de force. No wonder she featured so high in the top 50 horror performances countdown. There you go. You see lots of people were mentioning the old top 50 countdown there. Uh, Matt says, Bates and Khan are superb and the tension is on a knife's edge. Jameis says, One of the most harrowing tales committed to film. Misery delivers the frights and shocks to this day. Bates is perfect, Khan is perfect, and the mounting fear and perfect climax make this more than just a metaphor for the embattled writer and creator. What initially starts out as an escape thriller turns, to its credit, into a revenge flick in its final minutes to deliver one of the most cathartic finales ever put to screen, and a typewriter clotted with ash and Gore is an image never forgotten. Uh, Trina says, other than Mike Flanagan, Rob Reiner tunes in to Stephen King's characters better than anyone else. Kathy Bates' dark, terrifying humour and James Caan's vulnerability are perfectly portrayed. I love this film more with every viewing. Wonderful comments from all of you there, and I completely agree. I love this film so much. That's your number four. That's Rob Reiner's Misery. Into your top three then, and this is a fascinating top three. All three movies, very, very different, all from very, very different eras of cinema. At number three, you guys voted for Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Precinct six, Sergeant Allgood. Hello, hello. Look, a man is assaulting a woman at 125 West 9th Street, second floor, at the rear. Now, make it fast. Uh, L.B. Jeffries. Uh, Chelsea, 25598. I love that so many of you included this on your list. I mean, I guess how could you not really, right? If if you consider this a legit enough home invasion movie, how could it not come right at the top of your list? Uh, Caroline says, in some ways... This is the quintessential home invasion. Hitchcock fed our obsession for looking into people's homes and private lives and loved to expose us audience members as the voyeurs we really are. Getting a peek into other people's private lives gives us some kind of illicit thrill and Rear Window tapped into this kink while also providing us with some of the most technically accomplished and heart-stopping sequences in cinema history. Brendan says, I've only allowed myself one Hitchcock film in my top 10, so why not choose his very best? Toby says, James Stewart was the king of playing perverts, and this film is by the perverts director. Oh, and it has Grace Kelly in it. 
yeah, fair, fair reasoning. Adam says, while most people probably thought of films like The Strangers, this was the first movie that sprung to my mind when you mentioned Home Invasion being the subject of this season. To me, it's the ultimate Home Invasion. It works both ways. James Stewart as voyeur invading people's personal, private spaces, and then a genuine Home Invasion in the final act of this movie, which remains, to this day, one of the most terrifying sequences in cinema. And Kelly says, quite simply, Hitchcock's masterpiece. Nobody did domestic set thrillers like him, and this was Hitch at the height of his powers. Ah, wonderful stuff. What a film. So glad you guys put it in your top three. That's your number three home invasion film. That's Hitchcock's Rear Window. So from one of the most beloved and esteemed thrillers ever made to one of the most notorious and infamous and divisive films of the last 50 years, at number two, you guys voted for Michael Haneke's funny games. Hello. Sorry to disturb you. I'm staying next door. Please, come in. Wow, that's a really great set of clubs. Mr. Farber. What? Ah! You want to call someone? An ambulance? Or or the police? Why are you doing this? Now, I played the clip from the English language version there for audio reasons, but of course the version that most of you voted for was the 1997 version. Some of you picked just both versions because, I mean, it is the same film, isn't it? But Funny Games is your number two. Gotta say, I actually thought this might end up being number one, but it was pipped to the post by another film. And I guess this is a film that you either love or hate, and maybe not enough people loved it enough to push it up to number one. Because it's not an easy watch, is it? This is a very, very difficult film to sit through. As I mentioned in our Funny Games episode, I enjoyed the experience of revisiting the film for this discussion. And it was a fascinating film to talk about. But I think I'm done with Funny Games. I don't think I will ever watch it again now, you know, because it's not super enjoyable. Uh, This comment comes from Mike. He said, I went back and forth about whether this should be my number one home invasion film. And eventually I realised it simply had to be. This is the home invasion film. It's confrontational, it's infuriating, it's terrifying and devastating. It's not a film I'll watch on a regular basis, but the power of it is undeniable, and images from this film are burnt into my retinas. A horrible watch, but a fascinating one. And to me, that's home invasion. Couldn't have put it better myself, Mike. Uh, Keith says, this is brilliant. What a pair of creepy, slimy fucks that I would be too polite to kick out before it's too late. (laughs) Yes, agreed. Juliet says, after seeing this movie, toothy smiles and tennis whites creep me out. Uh, Paul says, it's like, how much more bleak could this be? And the answer is none. None more bleak. (laughs) And this comment from Nelly I love Hanukkah. He's so cold and calculating. I saw this when it first came out, as I'm old and pretentious. Like Soft and Quiet, this film makes me feel dirty and sick. But at the same time, I love it as I get how Hanukkah plays with us as viewers, as he knows we like to watch. Oh my goodness, yeah, it's a shocking and provocative film, but my god, it's a memorable one. That is your number two home invasion movie. So, before we get to number one, what didn't make it onto the list? I'm going to quickly reel off a few honourable mentions, films that just didn't quite scrape the top 10. So, uh, Ready or Not from 2019, that was a movie that got hundreds of votes actually and it came very, very close to creeping into the top 10. I think that's just such a favourite of so many people's, isn't it? It's such a fun, rewatchable film. Uh, Rebecca, Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca, also hugely popular, got a lot of votes. Angst, of course, as well. This is a movie that so many of you wrote in to tell me that you watched for the first time, thanks to the podcast, and so many of you were absolutely blown away by it. That's another very difficult to watch home invasion film, but beautifully made, absolutely beautiful. Uh, Creep, Mark Duplass's Creep got a lot of votes, as did Creep 2. And do you know what also scraped into the top 20? Home Alone. 
Love you guys. Uh, there were no Mike Flanagan films in the top 10. Hush just missed out on, on making it into the top 10. It was at number 13. Darren Aronofsky's Mother was also in the top 20, as was The Purge, as was When a Stranger Calls. I'm actually a bit sad that When a Stranger Calls didn't make it into the top 10 because that is... That's been a real favourite of mine. Also, movies that weren't covered this series. A lot of you voted for Martyrs and Inside, of course. And, uh, you know, of course, these are two absolutely iconic home invasion movies. Same with Straw Dogs. All three of these got lots of votes, uh, not quite enough to push them into the top 10. And they're all movies that we've talked about on other seasons. So what did make it to the number one home invasion movie and it's quite a hard one to predict right i imagine there's still quite a few of you who aren't quite sure what it could be so i won't keep you waiting any longer well it's a very recent movie and it's an absolute all-timer a modern masterpiece a movie that wowed audiences critics and awards voters your number one home invasion movie of all time is bong joon ho's parasite I mean, it makes sense, really, when you think about it, because absolutely everybody loves this film. I've never met a single person who didn't love this film, whether you're a horror fan or not, whether you're a home invasion fan or not. It's basically perfect, this film, isn't it? Um, I'm so glad there's so much love for it. Ashley said, For whatever reason, this never initially occurred to me as a film that would be eligible for the EOH home invasion season. Maybe because it's more critically acclaimed rather than a straight-up genre movie. But when you included it on the season, I thought, of course this is a perfect fit. Parasite is a perfect example of the effective way in which home invasion can tackle class and social inequality whilst also being a brilliant twisty-turny thriller. It's filled with genuinely shocking images that still live rent-free in my head and it's also very moving. A perfect film from beginning to end. Sarah says, what else is there to say about Parasite? I guess the only thing I can say is that as someone who had their house broken into and robbed by someone I thought was a friend, the idea of someone or multiple someones lying and conning their way into your home and family is just as, if not more scary, as someone breaking in a la The Strangers. Charlie says, one of the rare examples when the Academy got it right. Possibly the classiest home invasion movie ever made. Dan says, the most deserving Oscar winner in living memory. Funny, insightful, and occasionally harrowing. Also, it has a shot scarier than anything else in my list manages, i.e. the ghost. And finally, Vincent says, an ingenious, intricate, darkly humorous, sometimes absurdist and ultimately poignant satire of family, social stratification, multiple levels and capitalism. What a film, what a picture, what a top 10. This may be, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best top 10s of any season in terms of the ratio of absolute all-time classics. Let me run through that top 10 again. So you guys voted for as your top 10 home invasion movies. At number 10, Speak No Evil. At number 9, The Strangers. At number 8, You're Next. Number 7, Lady in a Cage. Number 6, A Clockwork Orange. Number 5, The Invitation. At number 4, Misery. Number 3, Rear Window. Number 2, funny games and number one parasite absolutely incredible a huge thank you to all of you that sent in your vote and sent in your wonderful critiques and comments so so good i loved reading them all uh, and i think that is a very very impressive and worthy top 10 list and it goes to show i think just how interesting and varied and diverse and also how fucking terrifying home invasion really is and there we go finally i'm gonna finish by whizzing through my own personal top 10 home invasion movies. I'm not going to spend long talking about these because you've already heard me talk about each and every one of these films in depth. So I'm just going to whiz through it super quickly. My 
top 10 actually features quite a lot of movies not fo- not featured on your top 10, uh, including my number 10 film, When a Stranger Calls Back. Uh, this was another first time discovery for me this season, and I absolutely fucking loved it. At number nine, I've gone with Speak No Evil, just for all the reasons you guys mentioned. Fucking terrifying. And number eight, I've gone with The Old Dark House, which didn't get enough love from you guys, and that makes me sad. One of my absolute all-time favourite universal horror movies. At number seven, another film that didn't get much love from you guys, Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs. I think Wes Craven is the master of domestic horror movies, and this is his best. At number six, I've gone with Hard Candy. It's a really uncomfortable, icky film, and I love it. At number five, I've gone with Misery, for all the reasons you've guys said. Uh, at number four, The Invitation, Karen Kusama's absolute masterpiece. At number three, I've put Funny Games, and I really struggled to know where to put Funny Games, but I knew it had to be somewhere in my top five, because it's horrible, but it's brilliant. At number two, and I was surprised as anyone else about this, I've put When a Stranger Calls, the original, because if I'm going by what films truly frightened me and chilled me to the bone this series, watching When a Stranger Calls did things to me in a really fun, classic horror kind of a way. So I loved the experience of watching that this season, and it's shot right up to my number two. And for me, my number one home invasion movie was my first time discovery from this season. Absolute gem of a film that I can't believe more people aren't talking about. And my number one home invasion movie of all time is Lady in a Cage from 1964. It's so messed up. It's so shocking and brutal and weird and ahead of its time. And I just can't believe it exists and was made at the time that it was made. Truly, truly phenomenal stuff. So there you go. My favourite home invasion film of all time, Lady in a Cage. Your favourite home invasion film of all time, Bong Joon-ho's Parasite. And that's it for this week, and that's it for our Home Invasion season. Thank you so much to all of you for listening, supporting this podcast week after week, for all of your incredible feedback and correspondence. I've loved hearing from you guys, and while we're on a hiatus, please, please do continue to keep in touch with us. Uh, You can follow us on all the socials, of course, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and you can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. There's a wonderful community of listeners around this podcast, and there are places in which you can interact with them you can join the evolution of horror discord or you can join the evolution of horror discussion group which can be found on facebook there's also a patreon channel this is where you can get bonus episodes every single week while we're off on the main feed for the next few months head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror and you can continue listening to evolution of horror content and you can interact with other patrons on there as well it's a great place to be you can find this podcast in all the usual podcast places and if you get a spare moment i'd be so grateful if you could drop us a rating and review on apple podcasts or whichever app you use particularly over the next few months i'd be so grateful for it as that really keeps us on people's radars and helps us get discovered by new listeners so As always, at this point in the podcast, we are going to be taking a little break. There'll be no new episodes on this feed until spring 2024. But I can now reveal, I mean, it's been touched upon and hinted upon already this week, but I can now reveal officially that the topic for season 10 of the podcast is going to be Nature Bites Back. So... What does this mean? Well, it's going to be a series of films mostly involving animal attacks and generally about the natural world coming to fuck us up. So we're going to be covering everything from King Kong in the 1930s to Creature from the Black Lagoon to classic creature features, films like Arachnophobia and Slugs and The Birds. Of course, we're going to be talking about shark attack movies like Jaws and Deep Blue Sea. We're going to be covering alligator movies like Lake Placid, Piranha, Piranha 3D. So many incredible horror movies 
movies about animal attacks. But beyond that, we're also going to be looking at other movies about the natural world and the dangers of the natural world. Movies set in the outback in Australia, like Wake in Fright, for example. Or films like Neil Marshall's The Descent is finally going to be covered this season, because of course that's about kind of humans that have evolved to live underground. Like anything in which nature and evolution is coming to get us, basically. So it's going to be a really fun season. After a year of tense, scary, bleak, claustrophobic thrillers all set indoors in one house, we're venturing into the great outdoors and realizing that the outside world is probably just as terrifying as the inside world. So that will be kicking off in a few months time. I cannot wait. But for now, it's time to close and lock the door on Home Invasion. Thank you so much for listening and join us again next year for another season of the evolution of horror.